So hello and welcome to the Project Slam. I'm Rebecca and I work for the communication at NEMO. And I have the great pleasure to introduce six very inspiring individuals to you who will tell us about six equal inspiring projects. And with this se session, we want to empower you to either get started with climate action in your institution, or maybe get a motivational boost that might be needed after a while when you already launched a project. And projects fighting climate change can sometimes, sometimes we can feel they have to be really big and huge. And we all heard Kirsten yesterday saying that we do need systemic change, but we also need to start somewhere. And uh, therefore, we have invited these six people to showcase that there is several steps between the big and the small actions that people and museums can do for climate. And after all, I would say that all steps are important because at the end of the day, what's the most important is that we do act and do something. So I will tell you a bit more about the format. So we'll have all six presentations, uh, all six people come up and do their presentations one after the other, and then we will open the floor for questions. So while they're doing their presentations, I would suppose that you write down your comments or questions that you would like to bring up in the Q&A. And first to take the stage is Anna Salvador, who works as the project manager at the House of European History in Brussels. Anna has been part of the team that developed the recent exhibition um, throw away the history of a modern crisis, which uh, made the House of European History take a very critical look at its own operations and literally start to sort through its trash. Uh, and because after all, you have to practice what you preach, and this is how Operation Rubbish was launched. And Anna, we'd love to hear more about this, so the floor is yours. So, I'd like to ask you, do you happen to think twice before closing the trash bin lid? Have you ever stopped to check what is already inside? Or when throwing away, do you happen to think where is a way? If you don't, don't worry. I was not different until three years ago. My name is Ana Salvador, as Rebecca said, and I joined the House of European History for a not so secret Operation Rubbish. And what was supposed to be only the fifth temporary exhibition of a, of a very young museum meant indeed much more for us. With the exhibition Throw Away, the history of a modern crisis, we were giving our modest contribution as an history museum to the current debate, current and urgent, on the climate emergency. But why rubbish? Rubbish is for sure not the only part of that environmental crisis, but it's maybe the most visible, the most tangible one. And it is everywhere, including in our museums. So was it fair to invite our audiences to reflect on consuming and disposal patterns if we were not ready to do it so? So this is how this exhibition opens space for experimentation in our museum. And we start moving from a linear to a circular, circular way of building exhibitions, because at the end, we were doing an exhibition about rubbish that was supposed not to produce too much rubbish, or at least less than previous temporary exhibitions, very wasteful per se. And could we tell the story of what Europeans were throwing away for the last two centuries if we didn't even know what we threw away the last two days. This is why we got our hands dirty and uh, some of us in our team became the modern rag pickers and the operation started. We uh, asked everybody in the museum to start using clean bins and to clean their waste, what is contradictory, and we would collect it. Uh, everything that was organic or hazardous waste was to be kept away for obvious hygiene reasons, maybe not so obvious. Every week someone failed to comply. And uh, therefore, all the waste was uh, verified meticulously a second time. 
Before we would uh, move it, starting carrying out from our two buildings to a third one, through check securities, long corridors, elevators, many stairs, many doors, until we reach a secret room in the basement, where that waste would be kept away from the diligent staff, cleaning staff, that wanted so hard to get rid of it. The, of it. What it did once against our will. Finally, after eight months, we got enough waste to fill in a visually attractive installation that would be the opening of our exhibition. It would be the testimony of our self-critic exercise. The visitors should be able to see in detail everything that we threw away for eight months. Well, not everything. Some things were kept away because they were too small or too big or too dirty or too wet because we complain about it every day, but somehow we forgot that in Brussels it rains every two days. So those things out, we finally started installing it. And we suddenly realized we forgot a not so small detail. It was simply not safe to uh, exhibit all those inflammable material in an open installation. So at the very last minute, we had to add a second container, a closed and uh, fireproof one, to contain the first container. What does it mean that after weeks drafting technical specifications with sustainable criteria, after months collecting the nicest reused materials or locally recycled ones, we finally uh, added, ended up adding a not reused, not recycled, brand new material. And this is just one example that building a circular exhibition is not always easy. Uh, circular materials are not always safe from museum conservation point of view. Most of the time they are more expensive than the linear version of it. And only when dismantling this exhibition, which what will happen in January 2024, 24, we will uh, be able to fully assess how wasteful we were because circularity is much about the afterlife of those materials. And by the way, in January 2024, we will also be organizing with nine other partner museums a symposium to share our experience. And uh, you are warmly invited to join us online and talk about those throwaway culture. And what next? Because we already anticipate that much waste, oops, sorry, much work is still to be done. At the House of European History, we just set up a sustainability task force and we will be doing our best efforts to ensure that the lessons learned during Operation Rubbish are at least not thrown away. And thank you. Thank you, Anna, for sharing your garbage with us. Uh, next in line is Harry Cutmore from the National History Museum in London, <laughs> where Harry works as a partnerships and program producer. And in 2020, the Natural History Museum boldly declared planetary emergency and set up a vision uh, for a future where people and nature could thrive together. And uh, with this project, the Generation Hope Act for the Planet, the museum moves beyond being a source of information to actually providing um, or like being a source, rather being a source of empowerment uh, for young people so that they have the tools to be part of the solution. And ultimately the museum would like to um, create the next generation of climate advocates. But I believe Harry, you will tell us a lot more about this. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, as you so perfectly summarized, um, I wanted to talk to you all today about a program that we're running called Generation Hope. Um, and we think this program exemplifies a lot of the strategic changes that we've been undergoing in the past few years. Um, we start with a question, um, and I think it's a question that we've been asking ourselves over the course of these last two days, and that is, what are we doing? Um, we are Europe's museums, galleries, science centers. Um, what is it that we are doing in the face of a planetary emergency? Um, we asked ourselves this question in our strategy in 2020. In 2031, it will be 150 years since the Natural History Museum first opened its doors. 
Um, so to mark this, of course, we had to write a very long and very dense strategy paper outlining how we would get there. Um, but we can surmise this strategy in two ways. Firstly, we declared that we are currently in a planetary emergency. We felt it was very important to us as a trusted museum that convenes thousands of visitors every day that we make this declarative statement that we are in a state of planetary emergency. Not just a climate crisis, but we are facing habitat destruction and biodiversity loss at unprecedented rates. We are very much facing um, the extinction of not only countless species, but our own as well. So we had to decide, what are we, the Natural History Museum, going to do in the face of this crisis? And our answer in our solution, our proposed solution, is to create advocates for the planet, to take our visitors and empower them to make a change. We identified three key ingredients about what makes an advocate for the planet. An advocate is someone who speaks up on behalf of people and planet for the benefit of both. These three ingredients are one, that we want to inform our audience. I mean, this is pretty simple, right? We are museums, we teach. We are also an active science center with over 300 scientists, and we want to make sure that the science is at the heart of the conversation that we are having with our visitors. It's probably nothing new to a lot of us. It's maybe the second ingredient, the inspiration, that is more of a shift for us as a museum. We didn't just want to center ourselves in this conversation. We wanted to invite the change makers, the activists, the young people at the front of the climate crisis who are experiencing the worst impacts across the globe to tell their stories and the solutions, to platform the solutions that they are implementing to both adapt and to mitigate the crisis. And finally, we want to empower these visitors. We want to give them the tools to leave our museum and to make a change in their own lives, to continue the conversation with others in order that we can build a network of advocates. So we built a program called Generation Hope. Generation Hope uses these three ingredients by creating a program that works for young people, that platforms our scientists in conversation with climate activists so that together they can discuss solutions moving forward. We want to give the visitors that visit our program the resources to make a change in their life. We convened an advisory board of our scientists as well as young activists from across the globe. For example, Daphne Frias, who is not only a climate justice activist, but also a disability advocate awareness um, campaigner who lives in New York. Like Mitzi Jonal Tan, who is living right now in Metro Manila in the Philippines, facing constant flooding and hurricanes. People like Selena Enlim, who was the youngest person to ever speak at the COP21 conference. These are the people who we want to platform at our museum and the people that we want to design programs with because these are the people who are our future. We designed a program of 18 events convening over 3,000 people over the course of six days. This was our pilot program. This is where we wanted to experiment with the advocacy model that we created in order to see if it worked for our visitors. And I'm happy to say that it did. It had a lot of the uh, intended outcomes that we wanted to achieve. People felt like they understood more about the climate crisis and they wanted to take away the fact that they, they could engage others themselves, learn more and change their own behavior. Of course, these are self-reported outcomes. They're not perfect, and neither was the program. There were plenty of learnings that we found, and I just wanted to share three key ones with you. But they can all be surmised by the fact that people want to know how they can make change in their life. And as a museum, we wanted to provide that for them. So what is next for us in this program? We ran this program in March of this year, and we will continue to run it again in February 2024. We will convene again a program for young people aged 18 to 25, engaging them on, on topics all across the range of the planetary emergency. For example, we are convening audiences on issues such as eco-anxiety. We are engaging people on topics such as how indigenous people play a role in the conservation of our climate and our environment and the rights that we need to 
champion for them. But we want this to be more than a program that just runs in London. We want this to be a global program that builds a network and creates a platform for people to come together. We, of course, want to root our program in what is locally available to us and our local communities, but we also want to work with you nationally and globally to create local communities that you can speak to and empower to become advocates so that we can together build a global network. So if anybody is interested in finding out more, um, or would like support in getting involved in running your own Generation Hope programs, I am available to talk to you more information, um, or please just reach out by email. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, and I hope you will get some emails later today and some conversations in the coffee break, hopefully. Um, next is Kato Eberling, who is the Head of Development at the National Maritime Museum in Amsterdam. And I think we all know about Agenda 2030, but do we know about Eco-Positive by Agenda 30, 2030 and more concretely how a museum can be Eco-Positive by 2030? Uh, Kato will explain how the museum is uh, working towards reducing its ecological footprint and becoming a circular museum. So Kato, please come up on the stage and share your positivity. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, first of all, before I start, I want to um, thank the NEMO organization to giving me a platform to um, spread our eco-positive words. Um, but um, to be honest, the main dilemma for me during these past weeks was, should I even go there in person? Please raise your hand. Who took a plane to Finland in order to get here? Wow, quite a lot of people. So, a round trip from Amsterdam to Helsinki has the equivalent of over 600 kilograms of carbon emissions. And we can do all those things with this total amount of carbon emissions, even enlighten the entire Eiffel Tower for seven days. That's insane, right? So, several ideas crossed my mind. Should I do this presentation digitally, I go by sailboat like Greta? but well, that would take me way too long. So my final thought was, okay, I'll get there, I'll go there for the six minute and minutes, and hopefully I can inspire my peers with our eco-positive story and learn from them as well. So I hope to exchange with you all more this afternoon. Um, so here we go. Well, I, already, I was already presented by Rebecca, very nice. And then I will go directly through uh, um, to my position in the um, National Maritime Museum is, besides that I'm head of development, that's the um, department that is responsible for fundraising and partnerships, I'm also a member of its green team and a co-initiator of ATLAS, the Future of Exhibitions, which is a platform and also we organize meetups for the Dutch museum sector around the sustainability topic. Uh, this is the National Maritime Museum, as you can see, a beautiful monumental building. Uh, we as a museum take the responsibility for our planet. And in particular because the shipping industry, as we all know, is one of the, uh, has a significant proportion in the global um, climate change problem. Uh, more than 3% uh, of our global, global dioxide emissions uh, can be attributed to ocean-going ships. So, as a museum, we set ourselves the ambitious goal to be eco-positive in 2030. And we, uh, our aim is to provide in the needs of today and uh, without putting the needs of future generations at risk. Uh, here are some facts on the museum. The more critical viewer immediately, see, immediately sees some obstacles to our up ambition in 2030. You see old monumental building, although it's renovated in 2014. Um, we have a museum and a depot too, um, we, we, that have um, uh, climate challenges, of course, and we reach and we have the travel movements of our public. Uh, the best thing we could do as a museum is quit our operations. But hey, we are museums and we can do better. So, um, we have the unique position to inspire our audiences to take positive climate, a climate action, as we are doing with this conference. Uh, then to our uh, sustainability journey. Um, imagine yourself on a ship 
pointing towards an eco-positive museum in 2030, and you have your steering wheel, with in the one hand you the possibility to reduce your negative impact, and in the other hand, uh, enlarge your positive impact. So above, uh, underneath the water, we have the negative impact that's uh, divided in five areas. Energy, IT and data storage, mobility, uh, horeca and materials and waste. And we're working hard to, um, through, um, to, re uh, to reduce our footprint by um, reducing our uh, negative impact. And on the other side, we're working on uh, enlarging our positive impact on four areas. Uh, personnel or staff, the public, um, programs and partners. And in this slam, I will mainly talk about our uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions, but we include all nine planetary boundaries in our roadmap to 2030. Uh, to minimize your negative impact, you have to know where you stand. So this is what we did. First, we did a baseline measurement, because to know, to measure is to know. Uh, second, we set a long-term ambition and we formulated goals on the five themes um, and calculated the uh, CO2 reduction that it will yield. And also we set 15 measurements um, and we specified our positive impact. So this is the uh, baseline measurement we did a couple of years ago, and that resulted in 5,000 tons of CO2, CO2, or carbon emissions. 39% belong to um, the waste and materials, and 49 due to mobility, so that are all the suppliers and visitors coming to our museum. What obstacles did we encounter along the way? I have a whole list, but I will enlighten some of them. Of course, the footprint of our inter international tourists is huge. Um, and in addition to our income as a museum, we get revenues as a very popular event location. We host around 400 events every year, from gala dinners to conferences, this has a huge impact on the mobility area, for sure. Um, suppliers who drive back and forth with materials and products. And um, but what I think is that we have to talk to our suppliers if they are willing to invest in, for example, electrified trucks. Um, and we cannot avoid um, hosting less events, in my opinion. Furthermore, it's hard to reach a agreement on vegetarian menu in our employee canteen, and since climate activists have glued themselves to pieces of art, there is an ongoing discussion in my museum, and I think many others, uh, whether we should accept money from our sponsors like um, the Dutch Aviation Company, the Harbour in Amsterdam, because they use fossil fuels. And I must say, in our new sponsor proposition, we uh, take a close look on the um, sustainability of our, of our company or our new partners. What I've learned along the way is that um, we should start a conversation with the partners because most of them are also working on uh, sustainability and talking with them, um, they will think along for sure. Uh, then I will talk about our positive uh, impact as a museum. Uh, I talked already about uh, mobility and we are uh, promoting public transport in, um, in our museum in Amsterdam. And next year we will launch a, a fully electrified boat together with a shipping company and 15 other cultural institutions in Amsterdam. Uh, and we will stimulate our public to uh, come to the museum or the other institutions by boat and by train. Furthermore, regarding our program, we uh, schedule at least one exhibition a year to put the sustainability topic on the agenda. For example, we um, presented the exhibition Rising Tide in 2019. That was a photo exhibition on the climate crisis and the rising sea levels around the world. 
And this year, or at the moment, we are presenting an exhibition that's called Food for Thought and that reflects on the huge role the Netherlands has in uh, the worldwide food industry. In this exhibition, we, um, uh, the construction of the exhibition took an important role, the sustainability on that. We, used, uh, we rented out uh, shelves, as you can see here, to, for the construction from a distribution center and we used cardboard uh, boards to, uh, for the text. And last but not least, last year we um, initiated Atlas, the future of exhibitions, which is a platform, you can look it up online, uh, where we share our, um, where we share uh, best practices from the whole Dutch museum sector and tips and tricks you can use. And we also organize physical meetups uh, around several sustainability topics. So to end up, uh, I have a thing that I would like to talk with you furthermore. I will okay, that's this. And um, to end with a uh, quote with Simon Sinek. Dream big, start small, but most of all, start. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Kato. I'm sorry for cutting you short, but remember the question, and we can talk about it in the, the coffee break, I'm sure. Um, so we're halfway through the exhibitions, eh, sorry, not exhibitions, but the presentations. <laughs> uh, and next up is Urska Rapar, who works as the curator for cultural anthropology at the Museum of Recent History of Celier. We're all probably familiar with working uh, with tight budgets and limited resources and having to find creative methods. And Urska will highlight uh, that being inexpensive, economical and practical, we are often, sometimes without knowing it, already being sustainable. Uh, so even if you think you aren't able to get started with sustainability measures, it's possible that you already have several green practices in place without maybe knowing it. Uh, Oscar, we're excited to hear more about this. Uh, so please, the stage is yours. Hello, my name is Urska Ripar, and I come from a quite small museum. We are 15 employees all together. Um, so this is how to introduce green strategy to a smaller team in smaller museums. And in terms of sustainability, we are actually, um, we have quite a lot of room for improvement. We are in this old and energy inefficient building, but that is something that it's not easy and quick to solve. Um, most of our uh, employees and also visitors come to us by private and not public transport, but that's also a problem of society, not so much of a museum, so um, it will take time to uh, change it. Uh, but what we can change and where we started was that not many of our employees were actually aware of the impact that their work and also their private life have to the environment. And uh, to be honest, the institution as a whole is not, not really fond of changes, so they come slow, and in this case, they come too slowly. So when about a year ago we started a discussion about um, how to introduce a green strategy for our museum um, to um, do some changes for a better future, uh, we didn't start with radical changes because we knew exactly that that would lead to more opposition than the approval. But we, were started, we first started with um, evaluating what we already do. Um, those are the practices we use for other reasons, sometimes because we have to, because we don't have any other options. But indeed, it turned out that some of them are um, the best starting point for our green strategy. So let's take a very quick overview of what we actually do. In our museum, we reuse all kinds of material. So we keep elements of past exhibitions, all the exhibition furniture, different materials, and try to adapt them to new designs. This also means that we actually keep thinking new, and if we uh, keep them in the exhibition space, then we don't need storage space. We don't have it all, uh, so it's really useful for us. We try to repair a lot of things. Sometimes we even try to uh, repair things that are not possible to repair, like plexiglass. You see it on the picture. This is on our current exhibition on the topic of waste. 
So we used um, this sticker, it looks like a visible mending. So um, it's completely safe to put the objects in, um, although it was broken before. And um, at the same time, it fits into the topic and also into the design of the exhibition. Um, what we do is we work in really small teams. That's something I always complain about because it means that you don't have um, enough experts to discuss with, you don't have architects, you don't have a big company to do the setup. You mo normally have just one or two curators, external designer, and one technician who is employed in the museum. But um, if speaking of sustainable production, it also means that we have a complete overview of the process from the very beginning till the very last detail on the exhibition. So we know what materials we have on disposal to work with, what we're going to use, and what we also know from the beginning is how much waste are we actually going to produce. So um, um, that could be a really good motivation for us to keep it low. Um, in order to avoid printing text on different plastic materials, two years ago we decided to use um, cardboards and we even thought that it's possible to reuse it. My idea was that after the first exhibition we would print on the other side, but in the very last moment when we brought it back to the um, company, uh, to print on it, it, was, uh, it turned out that it was actually not possible because the reverse side was not smooth enough anymore. So uh, what we did was the cheapest and the simplest solution by now. We printed on the recycled paper and used uh, drawing pins to attach them to the existing cardboards. Some of them were printed gray with the water-based color. So even after it, it was still completely recyclable. It was very simple and even our designer was satisfied with the way how it looked. Um, those kind of very last, um, last minute solutions are mostly possible because we always work with local companies. Even if their prices is not, are not at the lowest at first, it always per, uh, paid off at the end because um, not only that we save on transport costs and total emissions, they understand the way we operate, that they come to the museum, we can take them to the storage and show them what we have on disposal. Um, so that way um, we support the local business, but also local community. Um, so those practices are probably something that um, most small museums do, or at least those who are really on tight budget. But these are also something that we can include in our green strategy because they are sustainable. And the most important part to encourage our colleagues to do or to go with us on this way is to present them as the first steps because the first are all, always the hardest. And as you've seen, we have already taken them. So from here, we can really um, start to do some more radical changes. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Next up is Anne Lavens, who is the director of the Bellevue Museum in Brussels. And after pondering the role of museums in fighting climate change, the Bellevue Museum decided to curate change uh, and went on a journey towards sustainable uh, tomorrow. Uh, Anne will share the museum sustainability initiatives and what kind of effect they have had for the institution and for the visitors. So Anne, please. Hi. Thank you, Rebecca, uh, for this introduction. So. I'm Anne Lavens, I'm the director of the Bellevue Museum, uh, you see there, and I have six minutes, and Rebecca will cut me short if I take too long, <laughs> to talk to you about our sustainable uh, journey uh, we are taking. So when you look at this image, you see uh, I placed the Bellevue Museum on an ice lap, which brings us to the uh, key question of this conference, how can museums take action to face climate change? So the Bellevue building was once a luxury hotel, then it was a royal residence, uh, three consecutive uh, museums uh, had uh, their place in the building, and through societal change, the building uh, has changed very little. Um, interior changes were minimal, exterior even less, except for the huge class uh, atrium that was placed in the inner courtyard. Now, facing climate crisis, this needs to be addressed. We need to get this enormous carbon footprint of the building down. 
So, but first, I'm going to do a little experiment. I've never done this before. Please take out your phone, scan the QR code, and let me know the word that comes to your mind when you think of museums and sustainability. So you have about 10 seconds <laughs> to do this, so you have to be quick. Um, and then afterwards, we'll try and see if this will bring us a word cloud, which we can, after uh, this short talk, maybe talk about during lunch or uh, the reception this evening. So let's try and see. I think, was that 10 seconds, maybe? Yes? Not sure this is going to work. <laughs> um, looking at the technician. Let's see. You need to click. Yes. It's not clicking. So let's skip that. Uh, I would propose, and maybe we can uh, send you the word cloud after the presentation. Uh, so I made a slide uh, hoping that these were the things that you would uh, put in the word cloud. And I'm looking at um, waste uh, management, but uh, in an exhibition context, an eco-friendly building, waste from a temporary exhibition, and climate control in uh, our museum rooms. But I was also hoping to find education, engagement, awareness, other things that I esteem are also very important and inspiring to talk and to think about. But as we explore sustainability in museums, let's also think about how it connects with making our spaces open and how inclusivity is important. Now, in the two decades that I have worked in the museum sector, at first, you know, museums were still a bit of an ivory tower, you know, closed off from society. But we started opening up and being accessible physically and on the content level. We started to be inclusi inclusive. We were there for everyone. Participation became important, co-creation with communities, making exhibitions and workshops together. And after the digital rush, which stressed many of us, I think, uh, during pa the pandemic, we are now maybe facing the biggest challenge of all, which is sustainability. And so that, as Kirsten Dunlop suggested yesterday, we need to create spaces that continue to be relevant and inclusive. But where to start? For me, sustainability starts with the team. You know, it's been said in the previous presentations, you need to get your team on board, the colleagues, service providers, suppliers, inclusive transition, getting everyone on board and making sure we leave no one behind is key. And we have noticed, like many of you have uh, undoubtedly as well, that every new change encounters, you know, difficulty. Um, there is some resistance. It's hard to change working habits. It takes some time before these changes are integrated and they become just the way we do things. So you have to persevere. You have to talk about the reasons and importance. And maybe, like it was mentioned yesterday, sometimes you have to be a little bit of a dictator and implement certain measures if you want to accelerate changes. So with the team, we're on a steep learning curve, questioning every aspect of our functioning and our operations. But at the same time, we are work working more and more on climate education. So we are learning and teaching at the same time, organizing workshops and exhibitions on citizenship and climate themes. We aim to create awareness, stimulate critical reflection, and show that all actions matter, even the small ones, but most important for us is that we empathize that it's crucial to find the common ground in the different perspectives and find solutions together. Polarization is to be avoided and collective action and inclusive transition are what we aim for. Now regarding our building, we really want to bring it into the 21st century, proposing to cover our roof with a huge metallic structure with solar panels. This plan is enthusiastically being supported by the Heritage Administration that 20 years ago was being difficult about our question to put in double glazing. So we have come a really long way. 
And now the Heritage Administration is looking to the Bellevue to set an example on how you can transform a historical building to become sustainable. We are a test case for them and happy and honored to be one. Let's be bold. So our vision is clear, and I'm wrapping up, <laughs> and comprehensive. Sustainability needs to be in every aspect of our functioning. The building, the working culture, our activities and exhibitions. With our team, suppliers, contractors on board, we are aiming towards a sustainable and resilient future. But we also know that we will sometimes fail. And if we do, we need to learn from that. And most, of all, most important of all, we should never give up. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Anne. So we reached the last and final presentation of this SLAM uh, session. And uh, Elenia Valerio will share how the Natural History Museum of Oslo uh, have invited secondary school and high school students to share their thoughts about climate change and how they relate to it. And this educational program, Climate Dialogue, gives teenagers a chance to discuss climate change openly and freely in a safer space. And Elena, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Nimu, uh, for giving me the opportunity to be here and present our program. Uh, so today, on this stage, I'm going to tell you a story. So maybe a fairy tale, and every fairy tale has a magic wand. Um, I can start from... Once upon a time, there was a small country dressed in blue, white, and red. The country was pretty small, but there were pretty big things happening there. Can you guess what country I'm talking about? Any suggestions? No way? Uh, maybe? Yeah! <laughs> 100 points. Um, climate change was a pretty hot topic in Norway. And not everybody agreed on what we should do and how we should do it. So it was a sort of having two big teams. Uh, one of them was the hooray team, and the other ones were the boo teams. So people didn't know how to talk to each other about climate change. But luckily, not everybody was messed up by climate change in Norway. There were indeed some brave knights and wise wizards that every day from the wooden castle were fighting against this to make people understand what was going on with climate. And the wooden castle was beautiful. It had walls of glass, a waterfall from the roof, and a beautiful garden. But let's have a look inside. Is there no sound for me? Okay, imagine the music. <laughs> Bing! <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> All right, pretty cool, wasn't it? And one day, the wizard had a brilliant idea. They decided to open up the wooden castle for the young villagers to come and have some gathering there, which they call the climate, the climate dialogue. And when the young villagers were coming to the castle, they could visit the castle and learn more about how and why climate is changing. And when it was time to talk together, they liked to sit this way, in a circle, where everybody could see everybody, and where everybody could feel included and like worthy. Wizards as well. And the wizards were wise. So of course they saw that these young villagers had a big potential. But first, they need to learn how to talk and listen to each other. Because when you learn how to listen to other people's opinion, then you can eventually shift your perspectives about things. And so maybe feel free and safe to share without feeling judged by others. And these make you feel included, regardless what your opinion is. After a while, more and more villagers start to join these gatherings because they saw how important it was to see things from a different way. But 
there were some strict rules during these gatherings. It was not okay to attack other people's opinion, like in a debate, but instead try to listen to understand, like in a dialogue. Because actually, dialogue from, comes from the Greek, it means through the words. So it's a sort of flow of meaning. And for the wizard, it was important to ask open questions. Like, for example, how do you feel about this? Mm, what solution do you like the most? And why do you think we are keeping going the same way? But, of course, not even in fairy tales, everything was perfect. Um, some villagers really got disappointed uh, or angry with the wizards because, well, you know, someone didn't care at all about climate change. Um, some others were not ready to change their lifestyle because of what wizards were saying. And actually, could we blame them? They are teenagers. Um, Yes, so all in all, what we learned uh, by having a climate dialogue? Um, we learned that teenagers really don't want to fix our mess. They need to hear about solutions and not to inherit our problems. And they have pretty strong opinions. They know what they want, they know what they mean. And they deserve a place and a chance to be heard. And mostly, some of them really are asking, why should I do something when decision maker don't? Could we blame it, really? But on the way, we wizard, we understood that actually we could have done some things in a better way. Like, for example, it was difficult to stop teaching while sitting in a dialogue, because we are wearing so many hats all the time that sometimes we forgot what hat we have on and when. It's, all, it's never okay to judge others, so we want to show the same empathy, regardless of the opinion that we listen to. And, of course, we want to be neutral when we sit with them in dialogue. We just want to meet them where they are and not to get them where we want to. And if you have been inspired and are thinking about having the same in your museum, we have some suggestions for you. Find a suitable place, so it's going to be easier to create a safe space. So no interruption, no distractions. And remember to have a dialogue and not a debate and learn the difference between the two. And least meet them where they are. They are teenagers, they are confused, but at the same time they, are, they know what they, what they want. So we all relate alike to climate change and this is uh, important to have it in mind. So now back to the start, it's time to do the magic. So I try abracadabra. Yeah, it's working. Okay. <laughs> so what we really hope is just to help these young people in building that bridge across different perspectives and opinions by learning how to listen to others. And of course, you know, as library fairy tale, and everybody lived happily ever after. Yeah, of course. And well, or so we never know, and we are all welcoming any sort of feedback that you want to give us. So, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, we will now move on to the questions. So, you can stay on the stage and have a seat over here. And then I would like to welcome Anna and Harry and Kato, Urska and uh, Anne up on the stage again. And uh, I'll start, but please think about your questions and we will soon open up the the floor, so to close the circle again, which uh, Elena just did, <laughs> I'll go back to, to Anna, who has been quiet for so long now, <laughs> uh, to ask um, if this uh, circular approach that you had for the exhibition also has spread to the rest of the House of Europe his European history in terms of operations. Yes, indeed, this exhibition was the first 
uh, exhibition where we wrote it uh, black on white uh, in the technical specifications that it would lead our decisions. But we were starting a little bit earlier to do something on that sense already, building some more permanent structures in our galleries to allow future temporary exhibitions to reuse those structures. We were already keeping some displays and vitrines and the example was given this morning uh, that we could reuse later and um, servers, uh, service providers with whom we worked for this exhibition were asked to uh, look into that material and reuse it as much as possible and for the future uh, exhibitions that are planned uh, we are already reusing much of the, those materials including the ones that were uh, installed for uh, throw away the history of a modern crisis and that don't that those will not even move. They will stay in the same part of the gallery and be reused exactly as they are. And uh, much more is to, to come. Okay. Yes. yes, very excited to follow the, <laughs> the developments. Do we have a question from the audience to one of our presenters? Well, you can think about it. <laughs> uh, and in the meantime, um, I would like to ask you, Harry, and excuse me if you said it, because I was preoccupied for a minute, removing my earrings. <laughs> but these young people that you engaged with, how did they get in touch with the program to begin with, since this was the first um, time you did this uh, program? Uh, so, this program was preceded by um, an online event series that we did as, as part of an exhibition called Our Broken Planet. Um, so, we did have some existing connections, um, but really it was just as simple as us researching about the young people um, who we wanted to collaborate with. Um, a lot of these young people, they, they are looking for these collaborations. They want to work mm -hmm. with museums and galleries, and they attend things like the COP climate conferences. Um, and are, are working with, with the UN and within their own organizations. Um, so I, th I think there's this myth that it's sort of difficult to get involved with these people. Um, it's not, you just have to make the decision that you want to, um, and they are very open to you reaching out to them. Um, so what we're hoping um, as we continue the program is that we can facilitate some of those conversations between mm -hmm. um, the young activists that we work with and, and other museums and galleries. Great. Seems like the bottom line is to just do it. <laughs> Don't think so much. <laughs> it's that simple. Yeah. <laughs> um, Kat? Yes, please. Hi, thank you. Thank you all for sharing this story. It's really inspiring. I'm a colleague of Kato, so I won't ask her a question. Full disclosure, my name is Ninka. I was really curious for uh, also the others. Uh, how you feel about inviting in a more uh, radical approach to this topic, like we heard this morning in the panel with a uh, uh, wonderful person from Extinction Rebellion. How do you feel about bringing actual activism into the museum? Is that something that's terrifying or interesting? Does anyone feel compelled to, to answer? Uh, I, I don't mind starting. Yeah. Um, I, I think if, if you'd asked us five, ten years ago if we'd be able to run a program like this, it, it would have been no. Um, but I think the alternative is a lot more terrifying. You know, th these young client activists, they are working from a position where they are genuinely fearful about their future. Um, and, and as Rebecca said um, in the last panel, you know, they, they are just people. Um, and, and actually what we're hearing from our visitors is that those are the voices that they want to hear. Um, a lot of our older visitors sort of say, you know, we really appreciate the museum, we don't want anything to change, they have this nostalgia for the museum. Um, and the young audiences are telling us, um, if you don't change, we, we will not visit you um, in the future, we will lose your vis you will lose your visitor base. Um, so I, I think, yes, it is scary, but, but the alternative is, is fading into irrelevancy because if, if we as a big national um, natural history museum and, and science research center can't talk about something as important as, as climate change as the planetary emergency, what is our existence for? 
I could uh, follow up on that. We had few experience because we are a very young museum. We opened in 2017. But it happened that when the movement Fridays for Future was on fire in Brussels, we had an exhibition about uh, restless youth, about cold restless youth, about different generations of uh, Europeans uh, uh, demonstrating their uh, ideas on the streets or the way they were living. And uh, we invited uh, the Belgian um, leader of that Friday for Futures movement to a talk that was live streamed. Uh, so it happened in the museum and it was live streamed online too. It was our first experience inviting activists in our museum. Uh, our my colleagues curators also go very often to demonstrations because they want to in their uh, free time and uh, as a personal decision, but they happen to bring objects to the uh, to our collection that are testimony of uh, today history and uh, afterwards we invite those activists who were uh, uh, drawing the uh, posters or wearing a plastic uh, a coat made out of plastic collected in the sea. We invited them to contribute for the stories behind those objects. And finally, with this exhibition throw away, we were so lucky, I was so lucky because I was recruited for that uh, task, to meet people dealing with the waste management in Brussels and get their voices included in the story that we were telling. And uh, people dealing with waste management were not the only ones. We also uh, were in contact with Zero Waste Belgium, which is the Zero Waste Europe re representative in Brussels, and they are active uh, 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 defending a zero waste uh, way of life. So we were very lucky with all those uh, experiences. Yeah. We also have an experience of collaboration. Uh, we invited uh, Youth for Climate Justice uh, to collaborate in our current exhibition on the topic of uh, throw away. Uh, so um, they were the ones who, deci who decided what they want to c uh, contribute and they wrote an article for the catalogue and um, we invited them to do the guided tour on the, our exhibition but um, with their own words and their own perspectives. So um, to also give them a floor um, and to uh, opportunity to speak to museums visitors. Thank you. I see we have a question here. Oh, several questions actually. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> does anyone have a microphone yet? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, over there. A question for our last presenter for yeah. these climate dialogues that yeah. you have with the teenagers. Um, how often do you hold them? And also, how do the students, the teenagers, become part of them? Is it on a sign-up basis? Is it part of maybe um, like a scheduled school visit? Yeah, how it is happening, yeah. Uh, actually, we invite um, the class to visit us, but before they are working with uh, some activities, just to get to know what it means to have a dialogue together. And that's why they understand the difference, for example, between uh, discussion and dialogue, debate, uh, where in dialogue it's important to listen to others, while in a debate it's most important to talk. And um, not all of the classes they come across as uh, has had the time to work with it before. Uh, and not everyone is comfortable enough to share thoughts. So we have some experiences where it was completely silent, you know, and everybody was just, okay, what's your <laughs> who should start? So we have some techniques, we have some ways. We learned, we wizards, <laughs> we uh, museum indicators, we learned how to have a dialogue with them. And actually we see that when we ask the students, what did you like the most about coming to the climate house? Uh, several of them just name, oh, when we sat together and talked together. Because it's not something that they used to do in the classroom, to be heard for real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's nice. We can take one more question, but I would like to ask if anyone has a question for Kato or Anne. To see if we could... Do you? Yeah. Can I well, say? Yep, go okay. ahead. All right. Uh, I'm Lena Hanulena. I was working at the Finnish National Gallery and uh, I was thinking about all oh, this rubbish project, how beautifully we had Fluxus exhibition and we had Joseph Boyce the 1st of May, all oh, the rubbish he had been, you know, blocking some day and it has been reserved at the exhibition and and uh, then we have had 
beautiful project with young people so that uh, we were maybe six museums. Uh, they were uh, youth who uh, really didn't want to or, uh, not know very much about the museums and they came to work. But it was a little bit hurting because, uh, because they hadn't been working at the museums. And during our project where Hannah also was with, they started to love to be a part of you know, stuff and, and do real work. They had two weeks to prepare an exhibition. And then afterwards, they asked, can we for a summer job? And it was quite terrible because we did audience work and we didn't have the permission to, you know, allow the, to hire anybody. And, and so I was thinking about the administration and, and how we have been talking about uh, communities and, and so on, and activism and so. Uh, I was thinking that could it be possible to somehow make it easier to have a continuity with youth so that there would be a kind of place for young people to come and work at the museum. So uh, just, you know, change people so that they could have a small touch uh, how it is to preserve and create and you know, plan the future and, uh, and respect the past. Because nowadays, I think that the administration and everything is very, very complicated and, and very careful. Mm. And so uh, we'd always do projects. Yeah, because um, yeah, yes. you work a lot for the community, so perhaps you can, can you hear me. Is it on? Yes, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have some, uh, we've had two uh, youth uh, groups, as we'd like to call them, um, in the past. Uh, the, first, uh, the first one we called the Bellevue Band, um, and they helped us uh, with our uh, permanent exhibition about 10 years ago, because uh, then we were in the phase of the inclusion and the co-creation, and we really, our, f our most important um, public for us are young people, so we wanted to include them in making this exhibition together. So we had a group of young people between 18 and 25 for three years that helped us with the whole development and the co-creation of the museum. So it is, like you say, very important to find a way to have them on board and to work with them. And um, after the tragic, uh, the, uh, after the, the project, uh, after the three years, uh, we thought, okay, you know, they were, uh, it was very interesting, it was very engaging, we learned a lot from the young people, but these were young people that were interested in museums, and we actually wanted to do a project for young people that didn't go to museums. So we had an, a second uh, group of young people, uh, younger, uh, between 14 and 18, very diverse, because then we were really uh, focusing on, on diversity. And uh, we noticed that they just don't, didn't want to come to the museum, they wanted to have their own space. So we took out one of our libraries that wasn't really used a lot, and we made a living room for them where they could come and hang out and really feel part of the, of the museum work. And they would come in the week, whereas the first group came in the weekend and we didn't see them. And the second group came uh, in the week, on Wednesday afternoon, they would come and hang, and we had regular contact. So it is, uh, you can always find ways to engage um, the young people, uh, but you have to listen to them uh, and, and find a way uh, to make them feel at home and comfortable and welcome uh, as well, and also legitimate. Because the second group, when they first arrived in the museum, they were really, oh my God, um, can, do I actually have a right to be here? Do I actually have a voice? What is expected of me? This environment is so impressive. Um, I'm not sure if I will be able to deliver. So you have to put them at ease with workshops, with, uh, with take going on outings, spending time with them and including them and giving them a voice. Um, so it is, you know, um, administration is, mm, can be really heavy, but you can always find mm. a way around it. Very good. And then to, to finish off, because we are unfortunately running very much out of time, I would still like to ask you, Kato, if we take a step back and a bigger view of, on the sector, how do you feel, what, what do you feel like the museums and we can do for the sector overall, kind of? Um, first of all, I think uh, we should share our knowledge and experiences more often. 
um, for example, via a conference like this. But um, more broadly, I can think we should. I think we should formulate a shared mission, and we should take a sector-wide statement, and also take accountability to reach the climate goal we want to reach. Um, so yeah, I think we should take action as a whole uh, global sector. Very good. I think that's a great closing <laughs> word to take action. <laughs> that's what this conference is all about. So thank you so much for uh, listening to these presentations and joining us. And uh, I'm sure they will answer more questions in the breaks and at the reception. But we would like to say thank you for us and I would leave the stage to our chair of NEMO, David. Thank you.